Glacier National Park is a great place for hikers, with over 730 miles of trails. I've been hiking here since 1994, and I've made some of Glacier's most viewed videos that include lodging options, a sun road guide, and of course, many of the great trails. This video is just about the trails. There's a detailed look of over a dozen of my favorites. We're going to start in Many Glacier, which is one of the four hiking hubs in the park. And there's another in Canada's adjacent park, and I'm going to take you up there too. But before we do, please find the like button. And if you're watching on a big TV, it might be a little hard to find. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe, so I can continue to make these helpful guides. It really does a lot to support the channel. Okay, this is Many Glacier. It's on the eastern side of the park, about a 45-minute drive from the east entrance of the Sun Road. This is one of the great spots in Many Glacier, Swift Current Lake. I downloaded this trail map from the park's website, and I recommend that you do the same. The camera is about here, and the red boxes, they're all trailheads. Each trailhead has multiple destinations. I'm going to take you to Bullhead Lake, Iceberg Lake, and the great view from the Tarbigan Tunnel. Then we'll go to Lower Grinnell Lake. But we're going to start with my favorite hike in the entire park, the Grinnell Glacier Trail, where we're going to step on a glacier. There are two ways to do this one. It's 10.6 to 11.2 miles, depending on who you're talking to, from the main trailhead. There's limited parking there, so get there early and don't park where you're not supposed to or you're going to get a federal parking ticket. You can shave three and a half miles off the hike by taking the boat from the Many Glacier Hotel. These tickets are hard to come by, but you'll cruise across Swift Current Lake and then hike a couple hundred yards to another boat that'll take you across Lake Josephine. A spur trail leads you to the main one. It climbs pretty quickly out of the trees to great views from a cliff edge. This is the only switchback. But save your energy for the end, because the last climb is the toughest. But it's worth it. This is my favorite trail, and I've done it about 20 times. It takes about five and a half hours to hike it, only a bit less when you take the boat, because the trail that you bypass is also flat. But the rest of it is pretty tough. You go up between 1,600 and 2,100 feet to begin, depending on who you want to listen to. In about four miles, you'll climb from 4,900 feet to 6,600 feet above sea level. Tickets for the boat ride and ranger-led hike sell out quickly, so it's a good idea to purchase your tickets a day or so in advance. The boat leaves from the dock behind the Mini Glacier Hotel. During the lake crossing, a ranger describes the scenery. Then there's a five minute walk to Lake Josephine, where another boat awaits. Those who start from the trailhead emerge from the trees near Lake Josephine's boat dock. They then follow the trail along the northern shore. The weather can change rapidly near the Continental Divide, and on this September morning, frost covered the gangway. After the hike when the boat picked us up, the temperature was near 70. Ranger hikes begin with a talk about safety. This is bear country, and bears have the right of way. We learn the best way to avoid a bear encounter is to make noise. When a bear hears a human voice, it will likely get out of the way. But if you surprise a bear, it's likely to be unhappy, and you may have to use your bear spray to fend them off. The trail heads into the woods on a boardwalk over marshy ground. Just a few hundred yards from the boat landing, the climb begins. The trail gains a few hundred feet in the first 30 minutes, and on most days, the wind grows stronger. Soon, your efforts pay off with amazing views of Mount Gould, which dominates the head of the valley. On ranger-led hikes, you'll have plenty of time to rest, as you learn about local geology, wildlife, or any subject in which the ranger is fluent. This ranger is into geology. She tells us sediments which make up the rock of this trail are very old. The layers were laid down hundreds of millions of years, even before dinosaurs existed. Right next to the trail, there's evidence of the powerful forces which bent the rock and formed these mountains. Recently, rangers have had to explain one more thing. 
why so many trees in the area are dying. The answer is an infestation of a boring beetle in a budworm that feasts on new growth. The climb continues, and depending on the season, the foliage gets more colorful. Hundreds of millions of years ago, this entire area was under an ocean. This is fossilized seafloor. You can still see the ripples. It's now about 6,000 feet above sea level. There's a gentle rise over the next mile and a half, bringing Salamander Glacier into view, which is just above our destination. The saddle is reachable from the other side of the mountains via the High Line Trail. There are fewer trees the higher up you go, and the views of beautiful Lower Grinnell Lake get better and better. The lake gets its vibrant turquoise color from small rock particles that were scraped off by the glacier. There are other trails in the area. A trail on the opposite side of the valley leads to Pygen Pass. Bears aren't the only mammals on the trail. This little guy will attempt to get your food, but don't let him. In this section, Lower Grinnell Lake is a constant welcome companion. The scale of the scenery is hard to capture in a camera. Somewhere on that rock face is the trail. In a few minutes, you're beside another cliff face. In many places, the trail is little more than a narrow shelf carved into the rock. There are a number of waterfalls on the trail, but even in this remote location, parasites may be present, so water must be filtered before drinking. The glacier is now only about a mile away, and there's a small clearing. If this were midsummer, it would be filled with blooming bear grass. After the clearing, it gets steeper. It's a single track, wide enough for only one to pass at a time. Then there's an outcrop that provides one of the best views in the park. At one point, it's so steep that stairs are cut into the rock. Soon, you can hear the waterfall at the end of the valley, and there's another incredible view. Depending on your speed, you've been on the trail for two to three hours by this point, and you've climbed about 1,200 feet, so you need to be reasonably fit. Or an eight-year-old boy, accompanied by his rightfully very proud father. Grinnell Glacier is one of the most studied in the park. This lot is a U.S. Geological Survey team. At times, the trail can be quite narrow, Walking it may look perilous on camera, but it's not. Soon you can hear the waterfall. Eventually this meltwater will flow all the way to the Arctic Ocean. The trail was built in the early 1900s, but the first explorers bushwhacked their way up here in the 1850s. Back then the ice extended all the way to the fall. Turn around to see where you've come, and you'll see the U-shaped signature of a glacier carved valley and a string of aquamarine lakes. The boat dock where we started is at the near end of the second lake. Bears like this part of the trail because it's lined with berries. Ripe thimble berries actually taste pretty good. Just before the rest area is the best view of the formation called the Angel's Wing. It looks like half the mountain was sheared off, and it was, by a glacier that once filled this valley. The rest area is a large open area with benches and a pit toilet. It's about 0.3 to 0.4 tenths of a mile from the top of the trail. The hardest part of the hike is still to come. So this is a good place to stop, rest, have lunch, and maybe add a layer of clothing. Bighorn sheep frequently graze in the nearby meadow. This video was shot on a different day. If you're lucky enough to see a bighorn, remember that they are wild and unpredictable. The hike up the moraine to the Grinnell Glacier Overlook is steep. It rises almost 400 feet. And for many, it's the most strenuous part of the trail. When you're at the top, four miles from the boat dock, you may be tired, but the views are well worth the effort. If you're lucky, you may see a bighorn sheep up here too. Few continue to the glacier. Most just rest here and take in the amazing scenery. The glacier itself is still about a half mile away. Some even cool their feet in the very cold water. There's much to take in. The rock face is 3,000 feet high, the waterfall nearly 1,000. 
Like Lower Grinnell Lake, the water here gets its striking color from glacial flour, scraped off by the glacier. Most of those who make it up here know that the glacier is shrinking, and they want to see it before it's gone. This film crew is from Japanese television. As glaciers die, crevasses form near the edge, or foot of the glacier. Ice then breaks off and becomes a berg. Bergs now cover much of the upper Grinnell Lake. Over time, some of the bergs turn on their side, revealing ice layers that are hundreds of years old. Layers are also visible on the wall of the arete. They were laid down over a billion years ago. This is Salamander Glacier. In the early 1900s, it was connected to Grinnell Glacier. Today, the two glaciers are separated by hundreds of feet of rock. To get to the glacier, you'll have to cross a stream. I've seen just how fast the ice is melting. When I was here in 1995, the glacier was about 500 feet longer than it is today. Back then, there were still small ice caves, and the rangers were giving tours on the ice. The ice is now thin and flat. In fact, it's far too thin to walk on safely. Glacier melt isn't always bad news. In the 1930s, ice covered this spot. When it melted, it revealed 1.4 billion, that's with a B, year-old fossils of what was once the Earth's dominant species. These are stromatolite fossils. These humble algae colonies are responsible for giving the Earth its breathable oxygen. Before them, the atmosphere was carbon dioxide, but their waste gas was oxygen. They were formed in warm, shallow seas, proof that this ice-covered mountaintop was once a tropical shoreline. By now, you might be wondering what sort of effort is required to reach this spot. So I asked hiker Tim Curry about his thoughts. And uh, that last four-tenths of a mile uh, was a little steeper than I, uh, uh, I expected. So was the effort worth the view? It was absolutely worth it. Uh, I would recommend this to anybody who's uh, of sound limb, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody who was not quite in shape for the mountain because you do feel the altitude. It is a steep climb, it's very rocky, and you should be in shape for it. And fitness clearly is not based on age. This grandma did it and she's... 77. And she didn't take the boat. She started from the trailhead, five and a half miles away. It took her four hours to get here. And what did she think of it? Ah, oh, it's marvelous. The Grinnell Glacier Trail is one of the most scenic in North America and one of the few that follows a glacial valley past stunning vistas with an incredible lake and then ends at a remnant of the last ice age. This is more than a beautiful place. It's also a great place to learn something about geology, the earliest forms of life, and climate change. So when you're in Glacier National Park, if you do only one hike, the Grinnell Glacier Trail is the one to do. With about 1,700 feet of up, the Grinnell Glacier Trail is usually one I have to work up to. I tend to start with an easier one, like the Bullhead Lake Trail. It's proof that great trails don't have to have a lot of up. This one feels flat, though there is a couple hundred feet of up and down. And if you don't feel like doing the whole 7.2 miles, there are several other turnaround points. It passes a chain of lakes. The first is a great place to spot moose. The second has a colorful waterfall that's great for kids. And Bullhead Lake, it's in a beautiful terminal valley, below a pass that will cross from the other side a little later. The Bullhead Trailhead is at the end of the Swift Current Motor Inn parking lot. And the trail is a part of the much larger Continental Divide Trail. It begins in a forested area. After about five minutes, a spur trail leads to Fisher Cap Lake. Moose live in this area, and they feed in the lake nearly every day. Some say that most of the images of moose you've seen in nature calendars were taken at this lake. They feed on plants that grow in shallow water. The females tend to feed in groups for up to hours at a time, providing plenty of time for photographers to get a nice shot. They train their young to hide in the nearby brush. Moose move methodically in the water, but they can move quickly when they want to. Moose are the largest members of the deer family. This is clearly apparent when they get on shore. They are accustomed to people, but they are still wild, and you shouldn't get too close. Bulls tend to feed by themselves. The best time to see them is late afternoon to early evening. Bears tend to come down here around dusk, so it would be a good idea to be off the trail by then. Deer also feed here, in the nearby woods and near the shore. 
A few minutes further down the main trail, there's an interesting green rock formation. In places, berries grow along the trail. They are a favorite food of bears. So where there are berries, there eventually will be bears to eat them. Talking, singing, or making any noise that sounds human is a good idea when walking in bear country. About a mile and a half from the trailhead, you're at the eastern end of Red Rock Lake. It's another third of a mile to Red Rock Falls. From time to time, the trail heads through trees. If you're alert, you may be lucky enough to see a moose. It's hard to believe that such a large animal can be so difficult to see. The trail goes through dense growth, and even moose get tired of bushwhacking through it. So occasionally, they take the trail. Give them the right of way. Just before the falls, the geology gets bizarre again. Just imagine the forces involved to bend this rock formation. And you may remember earlier that the rock was green. Well, here it's red. Rangers frequently walk the trail looking for signs of bears. Anything out there of any interest? Well, fleeting sighting of a grizzly. This ranger was warning hikers that a grizzly was using the trail to get over the mountains via Swift Current Pass. Red Rock Falls is at the 1.8 mile point. This is a favorite spot for families. There are plenty of rocks for kids to climb on. So far the trail has gained only about 100 feet. It's another spectacular mile and a half to Bullhead Lake. The trail gains about 300 feet as it follows Swift Current Creek. The lake appears to be two lakes, but it's really one that's connected by a narrow channel. This is the first pool. If you look back, you can see the Many Glacier Hotel. Those are moose tracks in the water. The larger Bullhead Lake Pool is about three and a half miles from the trailhead. It's one of the most tranquil places in the park. Here you're surrounded by mountains on three sides. And at Valley's End, there are 3,000 foot waterfalls. There's another oddly shaped rock formation where mountain goats sometimes feed. And the lake is clear and blue. Primitive life can also be seen on this trail. The yellow and green blotches on these rocks are alive. They're lichen. Lichen grows very slowly. These blotches are likely to be hundreds of years old. For most, Bullhead Lake is the turnaround point. But the trail continues. 2,000 feet up and three and a half miles from here is Swift Current Pass. And beyond that, Granite Park Chalet. The view from Swift Current Pass? It's my favorite in the park. When in the mountains, it's only natural that you want to climb them. But this trail is proof that short, flat hikes can be just as memorable as a long, steep one. The Iceberg Lake Trail is one of the most popular in the park because of the views of the valley and the setting of the lake. It's also fairly easy. It's less than a 10 mile round trip that rises gradually just 1,200 feet to a peak elevation of only 6,100 feet. So overall, it's a pretty easy trail. The trailhead is located just a few steps behind the Swift Current Motor Inn. It follows a berry rich ridge and bears love to feed on those berries. So consequently, the trail is often closed. The trail is in and out of the trees until Tarbigan Falls. From then on, there are amazing views all the way to Iceberg Lake, which is backed by 3,000 foot cliffs. You're about to see what happens when a bear family is on a trail. This time there was a happy ending. But on my first trip to the park, 
I saw what happens when a bear wants the trail to himself. Because of all this bear activity, the trails on this ridge are often closed. The trailhead is just a few steps away from the Swift Current Motor Inn. There's a few connecting trails, so follow the signs. This part of the trail is shared with the Tarmigan Tunnel Trail, which we're going to do next. The first part of the trail is the steepest, with a climb to another junction. But from here all the way to the lake, the climb is very gradual. You hardly ever really notice that you're going up. So I'd put this trail in the moderate category. Just about anybody can do this one. You're now high enough to see the surrounding valley and its prime bear habitat. The trail climbs gradually, occasionally traversing a grove of trees. But most of the time, you're above the trees, where there's nothing to obstruct the views of the valley. When entering a grove, it's particularly important to make noise as a standard bear precaution. This was the first day the trail was opened, after weeks of closure due to bear activity. This is bear scat. It's proof that the bear threat is real. It takes less than an hour and a half to walk the two and a half miles with 700 feet of elevation gain to Tarbigan Falls. They aren't much to look at when the water is low, as it was on this day. But there are plenty of places to sit and to take a breather. It's a great place to get to know your fellow hikers. This couple is from Massachusetts. They wanted to see some wildlife. Where Susie got to see, finally got to see a grizzly. That was her goal. She wanted to see a grizzly. From a distance. We, yeah, we wanted to see them from a distance. That's right. Not up close and personal. They didn't know it, but very soon they would see another. And this time, it wouldn't be from a distance. After the falls, the trail is in the trees. Soon you come to an intersection. The trail to the right rises another 1,700 feet to the Tarbigan Tunnel and the amazing view on the other side. The trail to the lake goes straight. A few minutes later, I saw a group heading back down the trail. I recognized many of them from the picnic area at the falls. Why were they heading this way so rapidly? Some were nervously smiling, but nobody would stop their retreat to tell me. Soon I joined the retreat. Eventually, I did learn that a mama bear and two cubs were also using the trail. One hiker took these pictures and some video with a little point-and-shoot camera. Usually, bears will try to avoid humans. These blocked the trail and headed towards them. They got quite close. This is potentially a very dangerous situation. They were very lucky. The mama was only interested in teaching her kids how to find and eat berries. I and others had bear spray but none of us wanted to have to use it. After several minutes of backtracking, we saw another group coming. The lady in orange is a trail tour guide, leading a group from the Boston area. We all felt that she knew best how to handle the situation. Then someone came up and said he saw the bears leave the trail and go up the hill. So we decided we could continue, but we did so as one large group. There is safety in numbers. Secretly, I'm sure all of us were checking out the others in the group trying to determine who was the slowest, while at the same time, hoping that an old joke wouldn't come true. Fifteen minutes later, in a clearing, one hiker showed us her photos of the bear. She was quite close to it. I've seen what happens when a bear attacks on this very trail, and it's not pretty. The victim I saw in 1994 struggled down the trail, covered in blood. This witness explains what he saw. I saw him. Uh, he has a lacer deep laceration on the top of his head, and one across the, the chest and one on the back. It would have taken the victim three or four hours to get to the nearest hospital by car. And by then, it might be too late. So a helicopter was called. In the next week, he had to endure four operations. But he did survive. Youthful enthusiasm can be nothing more than naivete. This time, we were lucky but the danger was real, and the trail was again closed the next day. The trail continues to rise very gently, and it never feels like you're climbing, until the last little bit just before the lake. The trail then descends to the lake. The bergs that gave it its name are long gone, but it's still an amazing sight. Including rest stops, it took about three and a half hours to get here. 
the icebergs that gave the lake its name, are long gone. But it's still an amazing sight. The lake is surrounded on three sides by 3,000-foot cliffs. Numerous rocks provide plenty of space for even our large group to spread out and enjoy the quiet of the place. I stayed for about an hour, taking photos and fending off squirrels. We again grouped up for the hike down. It took less than two and a half hours. Recently, rules have changed to allow the carriage of handguns on the trails. One of our group had one, and I was glad for it. The Iceberg Trail is a popular day hike because it's an easy nine plus mile stroll. It's a great first day hike before taking on something a little more challenging. It offers a wonderful view of an alpine valley and of course the amazing one of a kind Iceberg Lake. The next trail I'm gonna show you has one of the finest views in the park. It's on the north side of the Tarbigan Tunnel. Its first two and a half miles is shared with the Iceberg Lake Trail, which we know is often closed because of bear activity. So I've only done this trail once, and it was a while ago before HD cameras. The only reason I'm including it here is, well, first of all, the view is really good, but the other reason is this hike shows how important it is to be prepared for any type of weather up here, because it can change rapidly. This is the toughest hike so far. It's a 10 and a half mile round trip that takes about five and a half hours. After the gentle rise of the first two and a half miles of the shared Iceberg Lake Trail, just past the falls, we head steeply up on another trail to the tunnel at an elevation of over 7,200 feet. It's a tough slog with a total gain of over 2,300 feet, making it a lot tougher than the Iceberg Lake Trail. The trailhead is shared with the Iceberg Lake Trail, which is behind the Swift Current Motor Inn. Remember the first two and a half miles is a gentle slope through bear country, so know how to be bear safe and make noise. The steady climb is mostly out of the trees, so there are nice views of the surrounding mountains. The temperature was in the 40s and the sky was threatening on this early September day. One of my favorite things about hiking in Glacier is the tree line is pretty low and you're often hiking above it. So here you get to see the mountains not just a bunch of trees. The trail does go through a few groves, and in one of them, there was some bear scat. If you haven't seen bear scat before, you need to know what it looks like. Big pile of bear scat. This pile is a bit old, so hopefully the bear left the area. This was the first day the trail had been open in weeks because of bear activity. It was closed the next day for the same reason. And if you see bear scat, be alert. These folks were heading to the Iceberg Lake, but now they're retreating because a mama bear and two of her cubs no, were using the trail. The trail one. I got this footage from a hiker who got out of the way and shot some phone footage of the bear family. This footage was responsible for closing the trail the next day. Bear activity frequently closes this trail, so if it's open, do it, because it might be closed tomorrow. The bears were seen heading safely into the woods. So the group turned around again and headed back to Iceberg. The first leg of the trail ends at Tarbigan Falls, and here they are. In the case you're wondering how long it took a 50-year-old man to get there. Tarbigan Falls took an hour and two minutes or so to get here. That race down well, the falls are nice, but not spectacular, especially when the water is this low. But it's a good place to have a snack and rest before the steepest part of the trail. Not far from the bridge, there's a side trail with a signpost pointing to the Tarbigan Tunnel. The Tarbigan Trail good, goes to the right and up the slope. And I knew this was going to be a tough hike. It's 2,300 feet up from the trailhead. So on this leg of the journey, I decided to take the lightest camera I owned at the time. It wasn't a very good camera, so I shot some stills too. The weather kept changing, and while there were clearings, much of the trail is in dense forest, which makes it easier to surprise a bear. And after about an hour or so, I was well above treeline and in a cirque. There was also a hole next to the trail, which was recently dug, you know, probably by a bear. Here's some of the bad video of the cirque in Tarmigan Lake. Miles away. It was drizzling and getting colder. And one reason I'm showing you this shot is just to point out how quickly cameras have gotten better. The camera used here isn't that old, but it uses an obsolete technology called videotape. 
Today, cell phones have much better cameras. And the switchbacks may look like they're cut into a sheer cliff wall. But they weren't too bad. It took only 20 minutes to climb the remaining 600 vertical feet to the tunnel. Here are my first impressions. Okay, 2 hours, 49, 48 minutes. Heart rate 119. It was much as 140, so I'm coming up this hill. Last bit of 600 feet of up. There's the switchbacks in the trails. Not fun. Started out 5 and a half, 5.2 miles that way. Started raining at the bottom of the lake, or well, halfway up the lake. There's the tunnel. It's cold, it's raining. It's cold, it's raining, I'm here. Tired. But the view's not bad. You know, it's not bad. I'm not sure it's worth all this effort, but I've finally been here and I've done it. My disappointment wouldn't last for long. This is the tunnel. It's only about 60 feet long. And the day before, it was occupied by a bear who was using it as a shelter. But this is the view from the other side. It definitely made this trip worth all the effort. The rapidly changing weather was a bit unnerving, but it made for very dramatic and impressive images. To the right, you see red rock that was laid down in a shallow sea millions of years ago. And that's Elizabeth Lake in the valley. There were a few other hikers up there, and we discussed the situation. While I was talking to one of them, I looked down, straight down. Then I quickly snapped several pictures. And it's a good thing I did, because a few minutes later, the clouds had moved in. And visibility dropped to near zero. It was time to start thinking about getting back down, safely. I took in the view for a while, but once the view had gone, there was no reason to stay. It was time to start thinking about heading down. They said a cold front was coming through, and I think it was coming through till tomorrow. On the other side, the clouds were even more dramatic. They were just rolling over the 8,000-foot divide. And by the way, I was so captivated by the weather that once again I forgot to take a shot inside the tunnel. And when you're out here, you're pretty much on your own. There are no reliable weather forecasts here. And the mountains tend to make up their own weather anyway. And remember, there's no cell phone coverage. So you can't call somebody or look at a radar app on your phone. It's an interesting predicament. There are over 5 miles and 2,300 feet of potentially slippery slope to go. And the trail goes through lightning-attracting, tree-lined bear country. It's impossible to know whether it's better to wait or to go. So I just enjoy the uniqueness of the experience. <laughs> it really was quite amazing. Then I had a snack and was about to head down. It's leading pretty good. Cold fronts come through. When it started to sleet. Well, people just came down if it continued, it would be a rather slippery descent. So once again, I had to decide, do I stay or do I go? Well, I decided to go. 45 minutes later, I was 1,300 feet lower. It was raining, and this is what I had to say. It's 36 degrees, I'm fogging up. About a thousand more feet to down to go, about three miles or so, maybe two. It's pretty cool, but now it was kind of scary before. And after the rain came the fog. The video camera kept fogging up, so I switched to the still camera again. Sometimes this hindered the view. At other times, it made it interesting. And when I got below the fog, the clouds got really interesting. I've hiked hundreds of miles in this park, and this hike was one of the most memorable. The cold, rain, sleet, and fog made it special. And I also captured one of my favorite images. I've shot thousands of images here since 1994. And in the few minutes that the valley and hill and lake was visible, I was able to stitch together one of my favorite shots. So let's do a quick recap on the Tarbingen Trail hike. It is one of my favorites. And the trailhead is just behind the Swift Current Motor Inn. It starts out in the open, and it's pretty easy. Then it gets quite hard on the way up. It is frequented by bears. It's often closed because of too much bear activity. So if you're here and the trail happens to be open, take it when you can. You never know when it's going to be closed. And later in the year, August, September, it's much more likely that that will happen.
In this segment, there's more proof that a trail doesn't have to have a lot of up to be a good one. Remember that beautiful lake we saw below the Grinnell Glacier Trail? That's Lower Grinnell Lake. And of course, there's a trail to it. It's a flat, six-mile, out-and-back, easy trail. Mostly through trees, but it has some great lake views. You can take the boat to make it an even easier trail, but we're going to start at the trail it shares with the Grinnell Glacier Trail, when you don't take the boat. There's not much parking, but you can walk here from the Mini Glacier Hotel or the Swift Current Motor Inn. Officially, the first few hundred yards are wheelchair accessible, though after a rain, I'm not so sure. The trail starts in trees, which is great on hot days. After just a little bit, we cross a bridge. And the trail skirts Swift Current Lake. The opposite Swift Current Dock is about three quarters of a mile from the trailhead. The short portage to Lake Josephine has the only noticeable elevation gain all the way to the lake. And it's only about 40 feet. And the short climb is well worth it, because this is one of the best photo ops in the park. It's the Lake Josephine boat dock, with morning sun on Mount Gould behind. If you're a photographer, this is the spot you might want to hike to just to get this shot. The trail follows the right shore of the lake. Berries are a reminder that this is bear country. And where there are berries, at some point, the bears will come to eat them. Hiking alone is never advised in Glacier, but that's something I do pretty often. And it's comforting to run into other hikers. The most important part of being bear safe is making noise. Hey, bear. Even loud talking is a good idea, even when there's no one else around. On this very stretch of trail, talking to myself saved me one time, and I didn't even know it. Hey, bear, coming through. At a clearing, other hikers told me that I had walked right past another bear. It was feeding just a few feet above me on the ridge. You may feel silly yelling, hey, bear, but it might just save you, because bears just might leave you alone as long as you don't surprise them. Just as I caught up to this hiker, some interesting geology caught my eye. This green rock is actually quite interesting. It's sedimentary. It was formed in a muddy coastal flat at the edge of an ocean. And this may sound strange, but way before the dinosaurs, the North American coast was close to here. The silt layers you see here were deposited offshore. When this whole landmass was near the equator. We hike because we love nature. Well, and when we do, we're lucky enough to see firsthand how powerful earth processes are. On this rock, there are fossilized mud cracks, evidence of a tidal flat. And if you're a super geek, you may remember the seafloor ripples we saw much higher on the Grinnell Glacier Trail. And they were red. These green rocks are much older than those red ones. They were laid down in a time when there was little free oxygen. Yes, it seems that the atmosphere has a long history of change. Okay, enough of the science lesson. Let's get back to the trail. Near the end of the lake, there's a boardwalk over a marshy section. Then there's a bridge over a creek. When we get to the West Josephine Dock, we're a little over a mile from Grinnell Lake. By the way, there's an outhouse near the dock. From here on, the trail is almost entirely in the trees, until we get to the lake. You also need to be aware that there are several trails in this area. There's a fork in the road. It's pretty easy on the way to the lake, but on the way home, the sign is not really facing you. So you need to look at it because you could go that way, which is the horse trail and the wrong way. It'll take you, actually it'll take you back to uh, Many Glacier Hotel along a smelly horse route. After a few more minutes, there's another outhouse near a trail junction. The side trail heads to Hidden Falls. It's not far if you're interested. When you get to another temporary bridge, you know you're close to the lake. And this is it, Lower Grinnell Lake. Its unique color is from fine rock particles that were scraped off by the glacier above. It's a pleasant setting to just take it all in. I sat on a log and had a snack before heading back. And no, I didn't feed this guy. The Grinnell Lake Trail is an easy, mostly shaded hike that takes about three hours. When in Mini Glacier, it's a great choice for a hot day or when you're just in the mood for an easy day. There are many more trails in Mini Glacier.
Some of them I featured in my 50 Hikes in Glacier video. But I'm only going to cover one more this time. And it's a horse trail. If you're not in the hiking, it's a great way to see the backcountry. And there's one trail that takes you to the bluest lake in the park, Cracker Lake. An outfitter supplies horses for the 12.8 mile round trip. And oddly, I haven't done this one because, well, the trail's covered in horse manure. And I like to hike. And frankly, I'm too cheap to pay the money to ride the horse. But I have family members who aren't so cheap. And they tell me that it's a great way to spend the day. So let me sum up the trails in Many Glacier. Well, they're great. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. This place is overcrowded from July to October. And starting in 2023, you'll need a vehicle reservation ticket just to drive in during busy times, unless you're lucky enough to get a room or a camping space. Go to the park's website for more info. Now we're going to leave Many Glacier and check out the trails on the Going to the Sun Road and up at Logan Pass.